So welcome everyone and uh, welcome to this new lecture of the Cities Gender, Civis Gender Studies Network. So for those who don't know us, this is the network of gender studies scholars of the, the European uh, Coalition of Universities, Civis. And today we're welcoming you, although the chat, I mean, the, the, the Zoom is based in Rome, at Minerva Lab in Rome, but we welcome you from Brussels from the Free University of Brussels and uh, particularly from Strij, which is the structure of research on interdisciplinary research on gender equality and sexuality. And we have the pleasure to have as a guest uh, today to present her research at the ULB, uh, Sarah O'Neill. Sarah O'Neill, who is an expert, an international expert on female genital mutilation. So I won't be long in a sense so that actually it's more interesting to listen to her than to me and to her bio. But to say that she did her PhD, she's an anthropologist. She obtained her PhD at Goldsmith College at the University of London. She has been working uh, for years uh, from there, from that time on female genital mutilation. She has been a postdoc uh, in Antwerp at the Institute of Tropical Medicine, so Antwerp in Belgium as well. And she has also worked as a consultant for especially the World Health Organization and the European Institute for Gender Equality. And since 2018, she has been uh, working, she has been lecturing at the University Libre de Bruxelles at the ULB. And uh, now she uh, holds since 2022 an associate professor position in medical anthropology. And she has a FET twin position. I won't explain what it means, it's Belgian language, between uh, uh, ULB, so the uh, one of the anthropology centers, and the Royal Museum of uh, Africa, Central Africa, uh, in Brussels, in close to Brussels, in Tevra. With that, I've, I think I have spoken enough. So I just give the floor to Sarah to present her research, and then we'll have some time for questions and comments. Thank you very much, David, for the introduction. Uh, I'm just uploading my, my presentation. Can you see my presentation? Yeah? Yes, it works. We, we also see the slide on the left, but that's fine, just so that you know that we also see the next slides in very small. Hang on, I need to see. So probably you need to put the slideshow on. Yeah. Let's see how we can get yeah, okay that. Okay, thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to present my research um, at the Civis Network. It's a great pleasure and honor to be here to, um, to present my reflections, or this is also based on work that I've done with colleagues on um, kind of controversy, controversies regarding female genital mutilation and modification. So, just to give you an overview of how I'm going to structure the presentation today briefly, first of all, so that we all know what we're talking about, I'm going to um, briefly uh, go over some case definitions uh, on FGM and international conventions on female genital mutilation. Then just as an example, I will briefly show a couple of FGM laws that have been um, formulated in different European countries. And then uh, look at some facts and figures, uh, court cases, and inconsistencies in arguments and approaches towards female genital cutting. So here it says female genital mutilation. I don't particularly approve of this term. I prefer female genital modifications. And you'll see th throughout the presentation, you know, how blurred the line between uh, mutilation and um, other forms of um, genital modification are. So the first part of the presentation really is to set, set, set the stage and um, uh, to provide a better understanding of the arguments that I'm making later on. So here, as you're interested in the topic uh, and you, you've joined this presentation, I'm sure you've read these case definitions before. So these are the WHO uh, case definitions. Um, the main emphasis is on the removal of the clitoral glands. There are more severe types like type three is the most severe uh, type um, of um, uh, uh, FGC. Um, and then you have a kind of the least severe type is the type four, which also includes practices like pricking, nicking, but also genital piercings, for example. So this will, this is, uh, 
uh, is important later. So this is one of the, the maps that is very commonly used um, by the United Nations and by activists or different people working on the subject. Uh, we have, so what is, what, what is called female genital mutilation is mainly practiced in sub-Saharan Africa where the numbers are highest, but you also have um, less severe forms of the practice performed in, in, in other parts of the world. Uh, like in Southeast Asia, but all, because of migration, a lot of um, people who are originally from uh, Sub-Saharan Africa and who practice these practices in their countries of origin now also live, of course, in diaspora countries, which is why they appear in, in green on this uh, particular map here. So what are the justifications against FGM? So it's said by the uh, WHO that FGM has no health benefits. Um, it harms girls and women in many ways. Uh, so we're talking about the, uh, the removal the dam and the damaging of healthy, uh, normal female genital tissue. Um, so this is uh, one of the, so again, just to, to note, no health benefits, only harm are the key words here. And then in the WHO guidelines on the management of health and complications, uh, there's also an emphasis on it being medically unnecessary. Uh, and towards the end of the statement here, you see uh, that it's considered to be a human rights violation of a person's right to the highest uh, attainable standards of health. So just to, to, to be sure what we are talking about in terms of um, uh, what the policies are based on in their justifications. Here, the Istanbul Convention um, uh, speaks of female genital mutilation as a form of violence that only women can be subjected to. So here we're talking about gender identity being kind of it being a form of, of um, violence that uh, women are subjected to because of their, their identity as women, because of their gender identity. And then to come more onto the legal framework, the Council of Europe um, justifies its stance against the practice on um, saying that it's a form of gender-based violence that's committed against women because they are women. And it's the obligation of the state to address it fully in all its forms and to take measures to prevent violence against women, protect its, its victims and prosecute perpetrators. So here you can see a clear commitment uh, from uh, you, you know, in, in, in you know, states are are, um, are asked to, uh, to to take legal action against uh, the practice in 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 different places. Okay, so just here, uh, this is coming back to the zero tolerance. We all know the sixth of February is the zero tolerance day. Uh, and here the formulation is female genital mutilation comprises all procedures that involve altering or injuring the female genitalia for non-medical reasons. And again, with reference to human rights and uh, the physical integrity of women. So this altering, it's not just, uh, yeah, it's not only mutilation, it's the alteration of the female genitals for non-medical reasons. So these are the important terms. <clears throat> Um, now, regarding the laws, I've just picked out a couple of notes. I know that in legal analysis, uh, there's a, a particular procedure methodology that is followed to compare different laws. And I'm not, this isn't my intention. I'm not a, a legal scholar. I'm an anthropologist. I just want to point out how the, uh, the uh, laws have been, um, have been formulated and the, the difficulties with some of, some of these formulations. So here um, you have um, facilité ou favorisé toute forme de mutilation des organes génitaux uh, d'une personne de sexe féminin. So this is, um, here we're talking about all forms of mutilation are illegal of, of, uh, uh, of women. As you can see, this isn't terribly, I'm not going to translate everything in detail here because I don't have time uh, to go into it. But there isn't, of course, the, the law is much more complicated uh, than one, this one penal uh, code here, one article within the, within the penal code. 
but um, it's interesting to compare this to other kinds of laws. So in the UK FGM Act, uh, you have a person is guilty of an offence if he excises, infibulates, or otherwise mutilates the whole or any part of a girl's labia majora, labia minora, or clitoris. But no offence is committed by an approved person who performs uh, other surgical operations that are uh, necessary for a, a woman or a girl's uh, physical or mental health, and this obviously includes uh, labor or other, you know, uh, other procedures that are need, need to be done for medical purposes in this context. So medical practitioners are, are exempt from this, uh, from, uh, from this law. So they are allowed to surgically modify uh, or, or, or these uh, parts of the female genitals. What for uh, reasons that could be linked to physical um, physical problems, but also to mental health. I think that's quite interesting in 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 the top part. But what is also interesting, if you go down to point five, is it says for the purpose of determining whether an operation is necessary for the mental health of a girl, it is immaterial whether she or any other person believes that this operation is required as a matter of custom or ritual. So custom and ritual are excluded from, um, uh, from as, a, as a reason for mental health. So, for example, if a girl is um, distressed or, you know, feels that she should undergo this practice because, of, um, because it's expected by members within her community. So this form of, of distress or, or mental health um, problems that are linked to this are not uh, in, uh, uh, included in this law. Now, very interesting is actually the Danish law, because it says any person who, by committing an act of violence with or without consent, excises or in any other way removes in part or completely the female external sex organs shall be liable to imprisonment. What's interesting here is the in any other way removes, and this actually um, includes medical procedures, other medical procedures, that are done by um, health professionals. And it also includes labiaplasty. So it isn't, uh, uh, or other forms of uh, kind of cosmetic interventions on, on women's um, genitalia. So when I was working on one of the consultations I did, I worked with Danish researchers and they confirmed that um, it isn't uh, possible for a woman or for a surgeon to to um, just perform a labiaplasty, for example, based on this uh, FGM um, law in Denmark. So as you can see, the modifications of the genitalia are prohibited for reasons linked to cultural belief, ethnic identity, and cultural aesthetics. And this is regardless whether it's carried out by a traditional authority or a, a medical professional. But what is actually, um, what I want to show now in this presentation is that there's actually a, a blurred line between what we call FGM or what uh, these institutions that I've um, talked about at the beginning call FGM and other forms of genital cutting. As for example, we have Shell Duncan's work on um, medical trends of medicalization. So the medicalization of FGM is, um, uh, um, often linked to the fact that it, it, when traditional cutters in, for example, just to take Guinea as an example, in Guinea, um, there were, you know, many people are aware of problems that uh, girls may have, for example, hemorrhages or infections that may be linked to the cutting being performed by traditional cutters. So there's a, a trend towards the medicalization of the practice, which means that instead of going to the traditional cutter, people prefer to go and um, go to the health center, either, you know, often it's performed by a nurse or by a midwife in this context. And what Shell Duncan and colleagues have shown is that there's been an increase. So whereas 20 years ago, the mother's generation here for Guinea, you see, or well, let's take Egypt as an example, uh, the mother's um, generation, 42% uh, of women had undergone an FGC, so a female genital cutting at a health center, whereas now, you know, the daughter's generation, 
uh, the 78% of daughters had undergone a medicalized uh, form of cutting. So there's a clear trend towards medicalization as practice being performed in the health center. Now, I just want to compare this to other. I talked about what constitutes or what is called a female, what is classified as a female genital mutilation, what parts of the genitalia are, are removed. Now, um, I want to compare this to female genital cosmetic surgeries. And here we have the Barbie procedure, which consists of trimming or amputating the labia, the entire labia minora. The end result is a smooth, unlined clamshell type of genital area in which the outer labia appears sealed together with no labia minora protruding. Again, here, the trim procedure is, has, is described by the American Society of Plastic Surgeons as um, a procedure in which the extra tissue is removed and sewn up directly. Next in popularity is the wedge procedure, which maintains a natural border after a pie-shaped piece of tissue has been removed. So also talking about the removal of healthy genital tissue, which is one of the things that kept coming up in the FGM, um, uh, in the objection to FGM at the beginning by the um, United, by the WHO. So some, you, you know, some um, scholars have started comparing, like here, for example, Brian Earp, who's a scholar now based in Oxford, has um, done a lot of work comparing uh, types of FGM with types of female genital cosmetic surgery. And here you, you can see that, you know, the types that I mentioned at the beginning are, are actually almost identical in some of the alterations of uh, the um, of the vulva uh, described, um, oh, you know, um, that are part of the case definitions of uh, cosmetic um, genital modifications. Um, but you may you may say, oh well, how? But it cannot be compared, um, or this is what has been said because cosmetic interventions are done in a way that are not harmful or that are perceived to be. And then there's also the argument of, of it being medically necessary. Uh, now here, well, there, there's a lot of, so this is um, Creighton is a gynecologist who's worked in the UK for many years. They brought out a, a published volume on um, a female genital cosmetic uh, surgery a couple of years ago, which is very interesting. And here, according to their definition, the labia, not, not definition, but they argue that the labia minora contain sensitive nerve fibers, which during sexual arousal, become engorged and diverted and contribute to the erotic sensation and pleasure. Loss of these tissues is potentially damaging to the female sexual enjoyment and yet such surgery remains widely accessible in many countries where FGM is not allowed. Um, the United Nations is actually, you know, is actually aware of this, um, the similarity between these two procedures or the fact that these, you know, the same parts of the tissues are removed as you can see here in, in, in this statement that was published as far back as um, 2008. Um, but it has been considered important to maintain a broad definition of female genital mutilation in order to avoid loopholes that might allow the practice to continue. Now, does this broad definition resolve the problem between, um, between female genital cosmetic surgery and um, what is called female genital mutilation? Well, over the, these are uh, figures here uh, from the International Society of Aesthetic Plastic Surgery. Um, so these are were openly available on the internet until recently, until this year I searched for the updated figures and I think they've stopped giving uh, people access, but it, it compares all kinds of uh, plastic surgeries. And here you can see that between 2015 and 2019, there was a 73% increase in labioplasties performed worldwide. And these are reported figures, so it's likely that um, um, 
it's likely that the figures are actually higher because this is only members of the International Society of Aesthetic and Plastic Surgery. And now to look at it more in more detail by country, uh, in Germany, um, around 11,000 labiaplasties were performed in 2020 in comparison with uh, 6,480 performed in 2017. And this is the highest figure worldwide. Uh, in Brazil, so this uh, Germany comes after Brazil and the US um, and um, yeah, so there is a clearly a kind of an, an increase in, in the procedure um, and just, okay, just to, um, whoop, what have I done here, um, just to compare this to um, female gen figures of uh, female genital mutilation or uh, estimated in different European countries. I think in Belgium, uh, the most recent estimate um, said that around 23,000 women were living with uh, some form of FGM in Belgium. Uh, and this is the total number. Whereas here, of course, we have these figures are, are kind of annual figures. So, one of the arguments, of course, that say, well, you cannot compare these two procedures, you cannot com compare labiaplasty with uh, female genital mutilation is that an adult woman chooses, if an adult woman chooses to undergo an intervention, it's not the same as uh, the practice being performed on minors. But there's a lot of uh, literature recently, particularly in the UK, but also in, in other countries, um, there have been reports of, of more and more girls seeking labiaplasties um, um, uh, in, on the NHS in this case. So this article that was published in the Evening Standard actually refers to the FGM law um, you, um, that I showed you earlier on. And um, it says that the law says we shouldn't perform these operations on developing bodies for cultural reasons. Current Western culture is to have very small lips tucked inside. And I think this is very interesting that there are these, you know, that there's this idea that this is part of West, Western culture has kind of an aesthetic standard of what the female body should look like in the sense, and it refers back to the FGM law. It's, uh, you know, quite, quite incredible. Now, this is the Metro magazine is a magazine that is um, a free magazine on the on the underground in, in London. And again, you can see reference to girls, underage girls uh, desiring, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, cosmetic surgery on their on their genitals. You also in The Guardian, you have um, um, articles that were published on, um, you know, um, pornography or the increasing images that we have on, on kind of social media images that are available to everybody that makes girls uh, paranoid uh, about uh, their, their vulvas. So now I want to come on to some, some court cases here that uh, look at uh, these differences. So this is a court case of um, in, in the UK where um, a woman in her 30s, who's a kind of a white British woman in her 30s who had already undergone labiaplasty and hydectomy, but was still unhappy with the appearance of her clitoral glands, um, also because of the, in, uh, the, the sensitivity that was the result of the, of the previous procedures that she had performed. So then eventually um, a clitoridectomy was performed on her uh, and she was very satisfied with the outcome. And she said that this is the kind of look that she uh, wanted 20 years ago. And this um, case was, there was an in investigation on this case based on, on the FGM law, but uh, the, uh, the consultant in London, uh, Dr. Veal um, responded during the criminal investigation, he said, the bottom line for me is freedom of choice. If you have a freedom of choice, you have a freedom of choice if you have the capacity to consent to do what you wish with your body. So the case was, was dropped, it wasn't, it didn't, it didn't go to trial. Um, but what is very interesting is that we, again, we have this 
um, the notion of, of a consent that I will come back to later. And of course, the fact that this was a kind of a, 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 a British woman who of non-migrant background who requested this procedure and uh, the surgeon was also of non-migrant background in contrast to this, so as you, and the other thing we want to point out here is that this is obviously a, a, a very invasive, so the clitoridectomy is not a minor procedure. It's, it, it is, it, it's exactly the same as a form of a female genital mutilation according to the case definitions. In contrast to that, I want to come on to, um, uh, to a case, the Australian case. There was an Australian case um, uh, I, th I think the first um, um, trial was in 2013 or 2015. Um, so this was um, a, uh, a case uh, of uh, members of the Dowdy Bora community. So it has to be said that a lot of the cases um, at the moment, or in, for example, the US case and the Australia case are members from the Dowdy Bora community who um, uh, are originally from India, Pakistan, but uh, obviously live in many other countries in the world as well. So in Khatna is there's um, is an important practice uh, in the community and is said, so Rick Schweder, who's an anthropologist, uh, has uh, stated that it's um, meant to reconnect the, the woman to God. It's to kind of enhance the relationship that the woman has with the God. And this is also linked to, um, to uh, some parts in the Old Testament that refer to male circumcision. So the way in which this practice is performed in diaspora is a ritual nicking or pricking. So no genital tissue is removed during this procedure. It's, it, it's, a, it, it's more of a ritual procedure. Um, so these three, um, three people were prosecuted, the parents and the person who had performed the cutting, or not even, not even the cutting, but the, the ritual was jailed. But eventually, um, no, it, you know, they were kind of, uh, ex different experts were examining the uh, genitals of these girls. And eventually the conclusion was that there was no evidence of any injury or any harm done to these girls. So uh, the case uh, was, um, uh, uh, you know, it, it, they, they were released because it was found that they were not guilty of actually injuring uh, the, these uh, girls through the procedure. So what are the differences between these two cases? Um, on the one hand, of course, we have a, a kind of a more severe form of uh, genital modification, kind of the removal of the outer uh, genitalia of a woman in the British case. And we have a symbolic form of circumcision that goes to trial, the, the, the parents are prosecuted, but eventually released. Um, so some of the important concepts that come up here is consent, of course, consent, you can say, okay, the British woman wanted to have this procedure performed, whereas the girls didn't, uh, didn't consent, it was a ritual, but then what about the injury or what, what about the, the harm, you know, anyway, there's all kinds of, of um, debates uh, uh, coming into, into this. Um, So just coming back to these procedures performed by uh, surgeons or being pre performed by health professionals, there's actually, it may be argued, well, you know, that uh, co cosmetic, these cosmetic interventions do not harm, they do not cause injury uh, because um, they are meant to, you know, they are professionally performed by highly skilled surgeons. But what about if it does go wrong and there are, um, on forums on the internet, uh, reports of women who um, who feel that they have been mutilated, and of course, if they're prosecuted, then um, then or if not, if they're prosecuted, but if if the the person or the victim of the botched procedure des decides to to complain or to take this case to court, it's under the FGM Act. So again, we're coming back to the, the similarities between these different procedures. 
Now, coming back to harm, um, to the notion of harm and female genital mutilation. So I did some uh, field work here in Brussels at the FGM specialist clinic for two years where I followed consultations of uh, women who had undergone some form of female genital cutting uh, and some of them either wanted to request um, uh, a reconstructive surgery or, or, or just to have a diagnosis of what kind of a procedure they had undergone or they needed other treatment of some kind. And what I found in this research was that um, sometimes women came and they believed that they had undergone a very severe form of FGM. They remembered um, you know, having been cut as children, that it was very painful and traumatic. But once they arrived at the, at the clinic, they received the diagnosis from the doctor that actually you are completely intact. There's nothing to be restored. There's nothing to be reconstructed or repaired because your clitoris is there. On the other hand, there were some women who had undergone a type two cutting at an early age, but they didn't remember the event. They never had any problems because of what happened. They were able to experience orgasms. They, they had good sex lives and they were talking about these things, but often it was um, kind of the reactions of other people, particularly health professionals or boyfriends who were who um, then said, wow, you've undergone a mutilation that made them feel different and that made them then desire a, a clitoral reconstructive surgery. And I've published on this. And of course, there's other fascinating anthropological literature who have, uh, uh, who have uh, described this in more detail, the, the idea of um, kind of sexual pleasure or, or what the mutilation stigma in a way does to to, to some women who've undergone the practice and who don't experience any, any uh, health problems because of the practice. And then of course, you also have women who remember these genital rituals in a, in a positive light and it's a source of pride and it, it's kind of a way of connecting to their kin group. And this has been described by the anthropologist Juan Bay Amadou and uh, Einstein. Um, okay. So it's also been argued that amplifying the stories of trauma and harm while suppressing the voices and experience of women who don't feel traumatized can also cause harm to affected women. That sometimes this is, you know, that is actually the idea that when you speak about a mutilation, women are more, can be more traumatized by the effect of these negative discourses than actually about how they feel about their bodies. And the other um, complex issue is um, that some types of FGM, like for example, a type one or a type four, so type four is just scraping, nipping, pricking, are not even visible or are incredibly difficult for medical professionals uh, to recognize or if they haven't been trained. Um, so one of the interesting aspects here that brings me back to the law is that um, there's an anthropo not an anthropologist, there's a gynecologist who's been working on these issues for many years, Birgitta Essen, based in, in Sweden. Uh, and she started working on this 20 or 30 years ago. She works a lot with the anthropologist, Sarah Jon's daughter. And um, she, she was one of the expert witnesses in some of the court cases, the American court case and the Danish uh, case that happened a couple of years ago. And she described um, in an article that she published recently uh, how um, some of the other experts on the committees actually admitted to not really knowing, not being used to examining the, the genitals of children because um, they, they change a lot, you know, um, uh, throughout uh, childhood and it's not an easy with all the the changes it's not always very easy to to recognize um, whether a girl has been cut or not and this adds a whole other level of complex complexity to um, to these court cases and um, and to distinctions between or, or you know just kind of using the blanket term mutilation to any type of uh, genital modification performed for 
uh, traditional reasons is incredibly complicated because actually the injury or the effects, uh, um, the health effects it has on, on women is, is it varies. It's not, uh, it's not something that you can take for granted. So um, some of the, um, you, you may say, or many people of course say, well, there is the, one of the big differences is consent. Well, girls who've undergone a form of female genital mutilation did not consent to having the practice performed. But we do not use this argument. This is inconsistent with other genital modifications performed on minors like male circumcision, for example, or intersex surgery that are also commonly performed without the child's consent. Uh, and these forms uh, of uh, genital modification are often more severe than minor forms of FGM like pricking or what I described among the dowdy borer in, in Australia. And they can be just as psychologically um, damaging. So again, Brian Earp has worked a lot of on uh, comparing intersex and male circumcision to uh, a female genital mutilation, if you're interested in exploring these arguments further. And then there's the argument around adult women's consent. So um, it's been suggested that women's ability to provide meaningful consent is thwarted by social pressures. So that our women who want to have these practices performed uh, on themselves. So for example, you could say, okay, you, you give women the option of, of practicing from the age of 18. And, but people, many people are against this um, because they say, well, it isn't, it, it isn't necessarily their choice. It's because of the social pressures within, within the community that will make them uh, uh, choose to continue with the practice. And post-colonial feminist critics have um, very much argued against this and said, that selectively questioning Southern women's capacity to reach autonomous decisions, um, it, you know, this isn't, uh, this, is, this is kind of a racist uh, thing to do is, why are Southern women not able to uh, reach decisions about their bodies, whereas we're not uh, thinking here about Western women. So Western and white women desiring surgical alterations to their labia, removal of the clitoral hood, tightening of the vaginas, and are not um, depicted as um, victims of social pressures that curtail their ability to reach autonomous, uh, meaningful decisions. So in post-colonial feminist critiques, um, white feminists um, have been criticized, so, uh, um, have been criticized for um, wanting to kind of depicting the non-Western women as victims of their cultures. And there's this idea that they need to be saved from sexist men's obsession with chastity uh, and that they, they need to be fixed in this way. There's kind of an obsession with wanting to, to offer alternative, you know, uh, this is one of the arguments, for example, um, by uh, Nurka. And uh, Pedwell argues that considerations regarding race, privilege, and nationality of such saviors are often not factored into, factored into debates around the legitimacy of, of interventions. Okay, and then we come back to uh, Rick Schweder, who uh, calls these interventions particularly by, uh, so this, of course, this feminist wave isn't, in, isn't new. It's something that's been around for at least since the 1980s, uh, this ne um, neo-colonial sounding discourse of disparagement, condens uh, condescension and denial of women's agency frequently employed by global activists um, who campaign against gender inclusive circumcision traditions in Africa and Asia. Um, so, in, of course, there are also, um, of course, activists in, well, for example, sometimes when I work with activists, I always try and, and soften the approach towards using the term mutilation because I'm aware, because of all this literature, I'm aware of the harm it can do and how offensive these negative discourses can feel to women um, in uh, who are from practicing communities, uh, but um, 
of course, you also have activists who very much want the practice to continue. You say, no, you've got to continue calling it mutilation. It is a mutilation. You've got to continue. But this is just to say that it's very important to, to look at both sides of the debate and to, um, yeah. Okay, my conclusion here is just, I hope I've shown you how complex the situation is um, and that the legal system, the way it is, doesn't work and it tends to increase inequalities based on origin, religion and socioeconomic background rather than, than um, resolving the issues as it said in the WHO's, uh, the United Nations Interagency Statement. A uh, long time ago. Okay, thank you very much. This is it. Thanks a lot, Sarah. So we have about 15 minutes for questions and comments. So if you would like to ask a question, just raise your hand and maybe you can stop sharing your screen so that we see everyone connected. Thank you. Good. Thank so you. if you want to ask a question, a comment, just raise your hand and we'll give you the floor. Nothing, no one? Sorry, I didn't read your comments. I um I, I was focusing on my presentation. But you were perfectly on time, so that was there is absolutely no problem. Great. So you can also type your questions if you're too shy to uh to to talk to the to the audience. So Francesca would like to ask a question. So Francesca, please do. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Sarah, for the very insightful presentation. And I just wanted to ask a very simple question. If you, um, whether you found during your research, if there are um, uh, national health systems uh, or countries in general, where, um, you know, physicians, uh, you think they are kind of better prepared to treat uh, women and accompany women and, um, you know, uh, without being judgmental or, um, you know, um, uh, confronting the situation of a modification of a genital, genital modification uh, that may harm um, the woman in question. Um, and maybe if you think there is something um, other than, of course, uh, getting informed on the issue and uh, um, overcoming the prejudice uh, physicians uh, can do to, to approach such a question uh, in a more thoughtful way. Thanks. Thanks for the question. Yeah, they're, they're, I, I, I don't want to make it sound like all phys you know, physicians are all incompetent. There are some incredibly, uh, incredibly competent um, gynecologists I've met over the years who've done lots of fascinating work. I've mentioned Birgitta Essen, there's Jasmine Abdul Qadir in in Geneva, who um, who is of Somali origin, her dad is a gynecologist based in in Florence, in in um, in Italy. Um, but actually, what what is fascinating, I think, is that um, of course there's kind of a, a desire to help women, whatever whatever problems they've undergone and and. Uh, issues that they are dealing with, whether these are psychological issues or, 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 or sexual issues or pain in, 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 in different uh, situations. Um, now there are studies, for example, there's a common um, trend in, in public health, for example, to do cup studies. I don't know if you've heard of these knowledge attitudes and practices, um, studies that are often done to assess health professionals knowledge on practices or their ability to diagnose correctly diagnose uh, conditions and this isn't just for female and genital cutting but also for other um, for other diseases or, or problems 
and these can be useful because they make um, they make people aware or they make people research. So most of there have been cup studies on looking at gynecologists and, and other health professionals in, in the US and Belgium, a few have been studied, uh, have been uh, undertaken in Sweden in many, in many different countries. And it's, it's um, very interesting to see, or it helps uh, kind of reformulate policies that um, you know, help the health system to respond to, to the need that women have. And, uh, in a consultation I did for the European Institute for Gender Equality a couple of years ago, there were some people in Austria. So Austria was one of the countries and um, some of the Sudanese uh, participants in the study, what they said about de-infibulation 20 years ago was absolutely horrendous. So that, you know, the surgeons or the health professionals were incredibly incompetent when having to de-infibulate so you know when infibulation the woman is closed and before birth she needs to be de-infibulated so she, the, the scar tissue needs to be cut open and there you know there's if you look at the literature there's reports of um, cesarean sections or uh, you know in focus group discussions that were done there in Austria there were you know women were explaining how how incompetent these health professionals were back then no, I think since then, you know, 20 years later, I think there is much more awareness. And I think that's why these studies can be incredibly useful because they help people identify gaps in, in gaps in knowledge and uh, improve training in, in these contexts. Yeah. Okay, thanks okay. a lot. Thank I you see very there, much. there is a question uh, by Marcella and there is also a, crash, a question in the chat. So the question, I suggest we take both of them. So in the chat, Govin asks, how do you draw a line between harmful cultural practice and medical treatment? What is the nature of this process? Is it based on primacy of the modern medical science or there are cultural considerations integrated in this process? And then Marcella, if you want to ask your question. Yes, thank you, David. Uh, yes, Sarah. Uh, well, first of all, thank you so much for your presentation. It, it was extremely clear and helpful, uh, I suppose, especially for the students who are listening and they are too shy to ask questions as usual. But anyway, um, I have something different in my mind. So I wonder, uh, so I apologize if it is really different from what you have been speaking about. But of course, uh, it, it crossed my interest as well. Um, there is something in, 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 uh, in the infibulation that always uh, struck me, and this relationship between uh, generations of women. Because mm -hmm. as a matter of fact, uh, um, I usually uh, elderly women in the family or the community, that are actually agents in this practice. Um, so it's somehow a patriarchal form of violence against young women that is uh, perpetuated actually by, by women. So um, I wonder, apart from the medical issues that you raised, if you want to say something about this. Thank you so much. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a very good question, I think. I mean, as we are working in social science, of course, society changes and and perceptions change of the body of of um, of practices. And of course, there's no community in the world nowadays that is not in in some way influenced by by these global discourses or by by these changes. And um, you know, I think it's fascinating there to refer back to. So one of the reasons I started working on this topic was when I was a student, I was like 22 and I read Janice Bodies and Ellen Grunbaum's work on, on de-infibulation or infibulation in Sudan, uh, you know, incredibly evocative um, descriptions of the procedure back in the 1970s. So they were, they were working on infibulation, de-infibulation in, the, in, the, in 1976. Um, and since then, a couple of years ago, I heard uh, Ellen present uh, on changes since the 1970s and how when she returns to these communities in Sudan, 
that they no longer perform these infibulations, but uh, there are much less severe, like it's just a sunna, like a, a, like a type two or a type one form of uh, circumcision that is, uh, that is practiced. And I think this is this is really interesting, kind of doing long term field work, returning to to the same places again and seeing how people's attitudes change and based on what these, uh, you know, these changes are justified. Um, now, what is interesting is when you uh, when you hear and there's, for example, one uh, scholar, Tamari Esho, Esho she's a, a Kenyan scholar uh, working on FGC, uh, and she said, along with uh, many other people, is that of the actually the rise in female genital cosmetic uh, procedures leads to um, to a backlash. So, uh, in in many of these countries, so. How can you try and try and decrease female genital mutilation when there's a boom in labio, labioplasty and you know you have like photoshopped vulvas on on your smartphone or pornography and this is the kind these are the kinds of images of the vulva that um, that people are exposed to on the internet and then they meet their wife. And the, the uncut wife doesn't look like the photoshopped girl on that they may have seen on a pornographic image on their mobile phone. So there are all kinds of the fact that these, you know, the, the presence of the images that we're exposed to and what they do to, they can actually be counterproductive to some of the movements that, that have been happening in, or the changes that have been in happening in, in Africa. And, yeah, so that's regarding kind of intergenerational changes and and um yeah the effects that this may have on the effects that these global discourses may have on people's attitudes yeah okay now the other question how to draw the line between harmful cultural practices and medical treatment uh yeah so i guess one of the main arguments this is what i've said already cultural practice if, if it's performed by a traditional practitioner then it may be considered or it may, there may it may lead to infections um whereas if it's done by a medical professional in the and that's one of the reasons what i think is fascinating is looking at egypt for example in egypt you have one of the highest rates of medicalized female genital mutilation in um, in Africa uh, or, or generally in the world. Um, but how does a doctor actually decide? So, so, so there's a real trend from move, you know moving away from the traditional practice um, practitioners. And if a, a parent feels the need to for the daughter to be cut, if they think, okay, my daughter has to undergo this practice because it's important for the community or for religious reasons then they turn to the medical practitioner but how does a medical practitioner actually decide okay i'm going to perform a female genital mutilation or i'm going to perform a cosmetic enhancement intervention i find that really fascinating this kind of decision making around what type of procedure is being performed by a by a medical practice by a gynecologist and how do they justify or, or classify this kind of procedure? So of course, if it's called what we call or what global discourses call FGM has a local terminology, often if it was in Egypt, for example, uh, a sunnah or, a, you know, there are other, other forms of, um, or, you know, local terms that are used in all countries uh, for the practice uh, and not necessary, but in some cases it, it, it is, link to aesthetics kind of a, a, an aesthetic um performance um f f kind of an aesthetic desire to to modify the body so okay. thanks a lot unless there is a last question we still have a few minutes but marcella has sent for students some data so i don't see any other questions so thanks a lot and i would like to to end by uh inviting you to the next and last lecture of this academic year uh, of this series 
So on the 21st of June, stay always at five o'clock, we uh, travel to Austria, to Salzburg, for a lecture on Women in American Studies, History of a Discipline from a Gender Perspective by our colleague Ralph J. Poole. So feel free to, to join, uh, I mean, the same system to register. And thanks again to Sarah for sharing uh, her uh, research and her expertise on the topic. Thank so you thanks so much. a lot. Take care. Bye-bye.